Okay, it's fine. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anisha. And on behalf of IDEAS, I would like to welcome you all for joining us this Saturday on a very one-of-a-kind uh, panel discussion on uh, women in blockchain technology. And um, I would like to uh, welcome our, our honorable panelists, uh, uh, Betsabe Botaitis, uh, who is the co-founder and CEO at Acon, and uh, Daisy Ozim, who is the founder at Resilient Wellness, uh, Sally Liang, uh, who is the uh, Chief Strategy Officer at Vitalix, and uh, uh, and also a special mention to our moderator, Emmy Kowan, who is the Executive Director at uh, Women's Blockchain Initiative. She will be moderating this panel discussion. And uh, before we start the discussion, I would uh, like to introduce you all to IDEAS. Some of you might not be familiar with what this nonprofit organization does. So I'm going to... Was all the way to the end. Um, sorry about that. So, IDEAS is the International Data Engineering and Science Association, and um, we are a non-profit organization who are uh, devoted to bridging the gap between academia and industry uh, in the fields of uh, blockchain technology, machine learning, data analytics. Um, so in general, we feel that uh, what students learn at school uh, might not be what the industry is looking for. So we have uh, organized a series of workshops, conferences, and hackathons to bring together the data community uh, all over the United States and the world. But uh, for now, in the United States, we, we began in 2016, and we have been organizing tech meetups and conferences in uh, Dallas, Chicago, New York, and uh, the blockchain conferences in at MIT. And uh, we have organized a couple of uh, blockchain hackathons, which are very popular. And uh, in fact, we had one uh, during uh, in November in Dallas. It, was, it, had, it received like a very good response. And then uh, last year, during the fall, we organized the uh, SoCal conference uh, at the Los Angeles Convention Center. Here are some glimpses. Um, that's from the New York um, Blockchain Leadership Connect, the Pasadena Convention Center, again, a conference. And then uh, USC. And as mentioned before, uh, like for, for the university students at uh, Washington, USC, UCLA, and uh, on the East Coast at uh, uh, Harvard, NYU, SUNY, and uh, University of Maryland. So we pretty much try to bring together the students and you know expose them to uh, what the leaders in the industry out there are doing. And uh, so yeah, we have come a long way and we aim to grow more and uh, bring a lot of other enthusiasts and inspira inspira inspiring leaders on board. And uh, if you want to know more about ideas, you can visit our website, which is on this page, and or you can go to our social media pages. And if you have any questions, you can email us. And um, so without any further ado, I would want uh, Amy Kowan to please take over and introduce our uh, very talented speakers and uh, start with the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anisha. It's nice to, to work with ideas and we feel honored to be a part of this. And um, we've got, like you said, Betsabe, Daisy and Sally here. And Betsabe is uh, the co-founder of ICON and Daisy is the founder of Resilient Wellness. And then Sally is the CS so of TallyX. So if you could, um, Betsy, could you tell us a little bit about you and Icon? Icon. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. And can you, hopefully everyone can hear me. Mm -hmm. um, it's great to be uh, um, with you today and sharing a little bit about me. So I have a long experience and career in fintech. And primarily in the last part of my career, I, had, I have experience in financial inclusion and microfinance. 
when I start learning, and the more I learn about financial inclusion and my microfinance, I start realizing that that what we're trying to solve, which primarily really helps other people to be, become financially included and financially sustainable, it was not a good solution. And I got very intrigued about blockchain. And I started learning about blockchain, talking to people about blockchain. And it was until two years ago when a very good friend of mine, Finally, we and I we met and start talking about our passions about blockchain and how the vision that we see of how can actually decentralize the power and remove the middle men. But beyond that, it can actually help emerging markets and people to be able to create assets and to manage their assets in different ways. That really excited me. So that's when we started Icon. Icon is spelled A I K O N. In ICON, what we're, what we're doing in ICON, we are connecting the real world with the blockchain. As many of you know, I don't know, well, actually I can ask for a show of hand here, but I don't know how many of you actually have a wallet. How many of you have done a lot of scatter or MetaMask? How many people, um, and how easy it has been for, for, for you? But blockchain until today remains in the hands of the early adopters and highly technical people. And, and what we are trying to do at ICON is, is, to, is to make blockchain a lot easier. So everyone, sorry, that's my bad on the back end. It sounds like you have a guest as well. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, she just arrived here. So it's, um, which, yeah, sorry. So what we're trying to do at ICON, an icon is to make sure that everyone can understand. Betsy, are you there? Oh, I accidentally put myself in mute. So what we're doing at ICON is to build tools for developers that make it easy for them to create, to create um, apps and products in blockchain. So essentially what we're doing is we're giving developers and entrepreneurs and startups the tools necessary on their necessary for them to solve the big human humanity problems. So we're kind of a middleware. Well and um, we we look forward to to knowing more about that and we appreciate all the, the financial inclusion that you brought up as well, because we know that's a, a big thing for blockchain. And um, as we're moving on here, I forgot to even mention that this is Women in Blockchain, which is what our webinar is on. And um, our next guest is Daisy. So if you could, Daisy, tell us a little bit about you and the work that you're doing in blockchain and resilient wellness. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Daisy Olzem. Um, I am the CEO of Resilient Wellness. We are a public health social enterprise, and we are designed to actually address intergenerational trauma within um, the healthcare system, within workplaces, within the education system, and in public policy. So we have a blockchain platform that we are about to release, and it's the whole goal of it is to, for public health equity. So um, I also am a part of the Blockchain for Social Justice Collaborative, um, which is how I really, really got involved in the blockchain space because I actually come from local government. So I worked for the city and county of San Francisco for many years doing policy work, program development, um, financial and economic uh, inclusion and empowerment work. I then kind of got disillusioned by the whole um, the, the way that philanthropy and funding works within those spaces. So I transferred over to social enterprise work. And that space is also a little bit um, funky too in terms of who gets money to do what for, for programs and addressing social impact issues. And then I learned about blockchain and retreat about like how can we you know save our society from itself. And I learned about uh, Bitcoin and I learned about time banking and other things. And I was like, this is gonna really help our community. So I've been involved in the ecosystem ever since then. So I started Blockchain for Social Justice Collaborative with a bunch of other organizations who care about like real social impact in our community because after the craziness happened in Puerto Rico, um, everyone's like, oh, social impact, social impact. But there's few people who really actually understand social impact and how to facilitate it. So our work is really about what's blockchain for social justice is making sure local governments and nonprofits have access to this information. We do incubators. Um, we do classes for, you know, I guess the non-technical folks and not the non-early adopters, helping them get wallets, getting them started with tokens, 
um, yeah, and we teach, uh, we actually teach fo folks how to start their own blockchain project as well for specific social impact issues. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much, Daisy. We really appreciate it. And now, Sally, um, you're the CSO of Taliac. So what exactly have you got? Wh what are you doing over there and how's it all going? Okay, sure. Yeah. So hi, everyone. I'm Sally Liang, uh, Chief Strategy Officer from Taliax. Uh, so what we do at Taliax, Taliax was founded in March 2018. So we're a very early stage startup. So we use blockchain AI to help suppliers to find the right working capital financing. So right now, the current market for, especially for small to medium enterprise, the, the reality is the bank is only financing like top tier suppliers and left about 85% suppliers unfinanced or financed with a very high interest rate. So what we're doing is we're trying to use AI and blockchain to really bring down the border and also solve decentralized identity and KYC issues, which are which is the bottleneck of a lot of supply chain finance. So we're building this block, uh, we're building this blockchain-based uh, global net, uh, network or platform to uh, bring buyers, supplier, and financiers to, together to provide better working capital solutions for the suppliers. Uh, in terms of my personal background, I'm an engineer by trade, uh, and then turned into financial service professionals. Uh, I've been working in different sectors in financial service in New York. I've always been in New York. Um, so I think it was my business school in YU Stern where I got the inspiration of being an entrepreneur and really um, put myself into a startup world, which is why I took an unconventional path after business school while all my classmates went to investment banking, management consulting, I dived deep into startup. I joined a square back Serie B startup, putting a lot of AI FinTech products into 20, I think it was 25 million um, uh, consumers' hands. And then, which in, essentially also uh, made myself to co-founder TEDx with my co-founders. Fantastic. I truly feel honored to be here with you guys. And um, I just want to go ahead and share my slides and talk a little bit about blockchain. And this is pretty basic. Let's see. Press continue. Okay. A little on the slow slide here. And once again, ideas, thank you so much for to having us be a part of this. Um, let's see. Okay. So women in blockchain, it's when I first um, met you guys, it was um, over the, the course of the last year. And it's very, very interesting to watch what you've been doing and then to keep up with you. So blockchain, from what I can gather, a blockchain is a growing structure of data called blocks. It's an open distributed ledger that can record transactions between two parties, and it's permanent and verifiable using cryptography. And the benefits of using the blockchain is greater transparency, enhanced security, increased efficiency, improved traceability, increased speed and reduction in cost. And there's serious implications for sectors that are dedicated to driving um, social impact. So some of the social benefits, which I, other than these industry, industries that are being affected, which are, you know, finance, health, manufacturing, real estate, government, and the supply chains, the social benefits get that going, is um, financial inclusion, energy, climate, and environment, digital identity, agriculture, democracy, and government, health, land rights, water and sanitation, which I thought was very interesting, human rights, education, and philanthropy. And Daisy, I look forward to hearing more about what your panels, because I know you've really explored this, so I, I want to learn about this. And I do have some educational sources, and I'd like to add yours to the list once we get finished here. So I'm going to go ahead and jump on into our first question. And Betsy, are you still with us? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> okay, excellent. And if you guys just want to take turns, um, we I'm just going to go into the first question. So we know the traditional blockchain definition, but how would you best describe the blockchain along with the benefits? 
Hmm. Yeah. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, the best way that I can describe it is, is a chain of, well, I'm trying not going to use the word chain. It's just a very powerful ledger that enables you to audit and it, the records can never be changed. And the true benefit of blockchain is exactly that it's audible, um, aud auditable. Not everything requires a blockchain. And uh, until today, there has been a lot of controversy in the market of what, what is um, the blockchain. Many people mention blockchain is a technology looking for a problem to, to resolve. But in reality, it's just a new technology that is very powerful because of those concepts. And the only thing that I would like to add in terms of benefits is that it provides to the user of any, consu any consumer the power of own, the potential power of owning the data. And that is the real promise of blockchain, that they will have control of the data, of their own data. Eventually, nada. And Daisy, what would you add to that? Well, um, I see blockchain as a, a type of technology to promote four specific things. Um, decentralization, meaning right now, as it applies to social impact, there's a lot of bureaucracy, um, there's a lot of middlemen, and that actually stalls the ability for folks to get access to information, to their own resources, et cetera. Um, second, it's the distributed access. So everyone has the same amount of power within the network and then everyone can see each other's transactions, which creates more transparency. And then it's also the, uh, the ability to be anonymous as well, because we know that there are specific populations that are currently under persecution, like the, the undocumented, uh, community, right? So using blockchain to create specific platforms that are anonymous to help them out. And then also it's the interoperability capability. Um, being able to compare and contrast data from different systems together to, you know, create a clear picture in terms of what these data trends are actually saying. So that's what I think blockchain is. And Sally, what do you think the definition is along with the benefits? So I view blockchain as a shared database. Um, uh, let's talk about, let's, let's say business transactions. A lot of time that, uh, uh, we, ha we have to involve middlemen, we have to involve like reconciliation, data migration, it's because no one has the exact same information at the hand. So a lot of times business in end up spending a lot of time just to call each other and say, hey, I don't have this data. Oh, you see this many transaction, I don't see it. So a lot of these issues can be solved by distributed ledger. Um, you don't have to set up a public ledger, which might inc you know, impact your you know, business secret, trade se secret. What you can set up is a, di a private permission-based dis distributed ledger, which different dis business partners, trading partners can share the exam exact same book, I will call this, so that a lot of time you can improve like business efficiencies, you can eliminate a lot of like data mis uh, discrepancies, which essentially reduce a lot of middlemen and a lot of cost and time to conduct business transactions. Fantastic. So to build on that, um, let's see, Betsabe, what attracted you to the blockchain community? The technology itself. Mm -hmm. Or and, just the community in general, like. Yeah, and then the community is incredibly open. I think that the, uh, coming from a strong financial background and working in big institutions, it just felt so different in the community of blockchain. Everyone is just so open to help each other because we are all in it together to have a fundamental trans transformation of how we operate as humans, how do we communicate, and how do we share information. But beyond that, for the first time, I felt people are gen were gen in the community of blockchain were generally there, hey, hey what, how can I help you? It wasn't like, what is it in, for me talking to you? How can I get ahead of my profession? Or how can I get anything from spending time with you? It wasn't no, like, how can I generally get to know you as a person, as a human being, and how can I help you? I have found over and over that sentiment in every part of the world where I have been in conference in blockchain. And it is absolutely 
rewarding and it just puts a lot of hope of how we can communicate in a professional level and how we can share um, our own visions. I mean, most people that are in blockchain is because they really want to make a huge difference, whether they use it for supply chain management or for any other social good or to reduce, to increase efficiencies and reduce costs in their institutions, the startups, so 90% of financial system, financial institutions are looking into blockchain and primarily because they don't want to lose the market share and because they want to increase efficiencies and reduce costs. But it's still, people that are involved, people that are using blockchain day to day are really there for a trans transformational change. I agree completely. Desi, are you still there? Of course I'm still here. Okay, perfect. And thank you so much for answering, um, answering these uh, questions down here as well. But um, what attracted you to the blockchain community? How'd you first hear about it? Me, Daisy? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, okay, well, what first attracted me to the blockchain community is, like I said, I learned about um, Bitcoin in 2014. Um, and I, re I revisited the blockchain ecosystem once I kind of went to more conferences, went to some of the different developer trainings um, that started really like grassroots and organically. And I was like, okay, this technology can really change the game for a lot of people. Um, so that's when I got involved and started doing the work with blockchain for social justice. But I, I think what really got me in is less about like, oh, this can make a whole bunch of money for people. But the fact that our community is really suffering from the economic disenfranchisement, right? And the lack of access to innovative tools. And I saw the ICOs and I was like, okay, well, if we can actually create, we can actually create a platform and a currency that's worth something and we can run ICOs to fund our projects to really accelerate, you know, change. That's why I got attracted to the blockchain space. I will say this, being a, a woman of color, a woman and a, a black person, and a black woman, which are three separate identities in the blockchain space, it is not as open as people think that it is. I see a lot of nepotism. I see a lot of gatekeeping. Um, a lot of the times people say, oh, we want to, yeah, we want to help the community. And they see the work that you've done and still there's no support and there are no resources, even though these people are sitting on like a whole bunch of like resources to do the work. So there's still a lot of work to do in terms of social impact. And I also notice, you know, what really also got me involved is what was being considered social impacts in the blockchain space, which I consider to be super mediocre, not trying to be condescending at all, but just really like, okay, coming from the social impact space myself, I was like, this is not social impact. These are people trying to basically uh, make a name for themselves and of marginalized communities, okay? That's, it's funny, when I first met you, you were the one that attracted me to the blockchain community because of the way that you speak about it. So it does inspire people when you have these honest discussions. Sally, what, um, <laughs> what, um, what, can, what attracted you to the blockchain community? Like you told us a little bit earlier, but expand on that. Yeah, sure. So my, except learning, like learning about Bitcoin like, like a few years ago, but what really drew my attention to blockchain was, uh, I think it was 2016, I was the president of New, uh, New Finance, which is a FinTech uh, business community community with more than 20,000 members across the globe. So I hosted a lot of meetups and um, uh, I mean topics in different uh, areas of FinTech. And then I just saw more and more traction and interest in the blockchain distributed ledger. So which let me in, uh, dive deep into this technology and also talk to uh, friends and experts in the, in, the, in the industry. And the more and more I, I, I know about this uh, 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 community and also technology and also seeing a centralized platform can cause many, many problems to the society. This is where really, um, you know, trigger the, um, the I would say the, the 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 point in my in my mind that I should do something in this community. And what I think is different in blockchain community than other communities is that people are much more willing to share information. So because blockchain is all built upon like being transparent, being decentralized, uh, there are open standards and open protocols for people to use. 
So a lot of this, um, uh, I would say, uh, personalities and also cultural is not easily found in other communities. I agree completely. Um, so Betsy, for someone that is new to the blockchain, and I'm seeing you have an, the answering the questions about the B2B and B2C, but what are the skills needed to obtain employment in the blockchain-based businesses? I think that beyond, beyond the specific skills is the desire to learn. You know, we all are learning blockchain as we go in. And yes, I've, it's been about five to six years that I can follow on blockchain, but it's been only the last two years that I've been incredibly involved. And believe me, every day I feel like I don't know anything. I, every day is, um, it's like have, it's, it's learning something completely new and you feel like you know it and you're like, yes, I'm understanding it. And the next day, everything changed. Like what happened to, what happened to the ICOs and now we're talking about utility tokens and now it's STOs and so on. And that's a simple example of an element of blockchain. But what does someone need? I think that really a huge desire to learn. If someone specifically have um, knowledge, uh, prior knowledge of coding, will be good because having the conversations on blockchain requires to be sometimes a little bit more technical. Um, and I think that not only the technical people should be involved in blockchain, I think that everyone should be involved in blockchain, also the business person. I consider myself to be a business person. And even though I code in several languages, I still see myself as a business person. And I think that what makes a difference between those that are being really more um, upfront and I wouldn't say successful because in blockchain, I said, it's new. We are all growing together, but we have, they have more influence in the community are those that really have taken on their own to learn and to be in the hackathons, in the communities, to be out there and learning every single day and also guessing always what you just learned because it keeps evolving so constantly. So that's what I would say is necessary. More a state that's, of mind. And Daisy, I know you have some slides, so if you want to interject any of that, but what's, what, what skills do you think is needed if you wanted to attain employment or help with the social, social justice? Well, I think um, the great thing about the blockchain space is that they need all kinds of people. They really, being technical is one piece, but they need folks who are good in marketing. They need folks who are good in um, social impact within whatever specific like field that is, whether it's environment or health or um, data privacy or uh, uh, education. There's actually no, how would I say this? Because blockchain is so new, and um, a lot of the people that are, are creating projects, they actually have no idea about the problems that they're trying to really like address. They just are kind of just creating projects. There's space for everybody to get involved. So if you're listening and you want to get involved in the field, there is something for you to do. Trust and believe that. OK, you just have to believe in yourself and you kind of have to be bullish. Um, not a bully, but like bullish about like getting into this space, meaning you got to network. You got to network. You got to go to the events. You got to put yourself out there. Um, you got to let them know like, hey, I, I'm not a developer. I'm not an investor. I haven't been in fintech, but I do know that my skills can help, right? So that's one thing I wanted to say. Now, let me go into, I'm going to just share like just some of the work that we're doing with blockchain for social, for social justice, okay? So let me just share my, my slides right here. Okay. Okay, so awesome, blockchain for social justice. So basically um, our guiding principles are accessibility. So we do that by, because for blockchain to actually have any worth really, it's going to take mass adoption, right? And if we're talking about mass adoption, mass adoption for who? Is it like the existing tech bros? It's, is it those of us who kind of like are, you know, we were lucky enough to have like a certain professional career and certain networks that brought us in, right? Or is it really gonna be to the masses of people who really need this technology to better their lives? So we do educational events, um, incubators and conferences to, you know, work directly with those marginalized communities and those disconnected populations that are gonna actually drive a lot of use on these platforms. 
The second is equity. So, you know, addressing the lack of equity within the crypto space, because this is the future of money, right? And we can't have the same people that created the problem, which is straight white men leading the next movement. We need women, we need peoples of color, we need um, all kinds of folks, okay? And I know some folks be like, well, we don't need identity politics and technology. Actually, you do. Because the reason why we're in the problem that we're having now with the, the lack of tech equity and how technology is actually destroying certain communities is because we don't actually take into consideration, you know, the history of marginalization in certain communities, okay? So, and then lastly is innovation, right? Because we know that, um, certain communities, there's a whole bunch of creativity and innovation there, you know, but there it's not being harnessed and utilized because they are not being tapped into and given the opportunities to innovate, okay? And we can't have innovative projects um, if we don't actually create the space for, you know, innovation to come into this space. So we know that, you know, uh, I know that they had a whole bunch of different studies showing that having more women and having more diversity actually improves your bottom line. So we already know the numbers are there, okay? So what can, yeah. Oh, so, sorry about that. No, no worries. So why blockchain? What can it do for social impact? Okay. So first it can help with incentivizing behavior change because a lot of social impact issues, they're really rooted in needing to change a certain behavior to create a, a more beneficial outcome in society. Second is fundraising um, via security token offerings or, or ICOs. I know that that has been dampened a little bit, but hopefully, you know, the SEC just, you know, they get some whiff of sense and they create good re regulation that allows the market to flow free again. But traditionally, the way that uh, social impact issues are being funded is by philanthropy or by, you know, um, some supposed social impact funds that are just continuing to fund the same exact projects that are causing more harm in the community. But with blockchain, we can create our own platforms and we can, you know, flush our own systems. Another is the, the data interoperability, um, being able to compare data from different systems to create, you know, better outcomes. Um, so like, you know, let's say for instance, for the state of California, if they create some type of interoperability between, you know, the different welfare systems and, you know, the different education systems, et cetera, just allowing for data to flow more easily, allowing for us to analyze data more easily. There's also the ability for it to be anonymous because we know that certain populations are under target with this administration, right? So blockchain really came right on time. And then also the fact that it's being decentralized. And I know that there's also um, the movement to keep blockchain decentralized, but because of some of the craziness that has gone on, you know, it's moving more towards a, a centralized space. So I, me personally, I think having a mix between the two is gonna be okay. I don't believe in absolute centralization. I don't believe in absolute decentralization because we've had problems on both sides, right? Can and we bring Sally in on that, on that point? Only because I think you mentioned a decentralized, um, didn't you? You mentioned something earlier about it being more centralized, even if it, can you expand on what you said earlier? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would say uh, a lot of problems that are uh, caused by a centralized, let's say database, like identity hacks, uh, data breaches, can be solved with a decentralized uh, setup or even semi-decentralized is still better than a single point of hacking. Exactly. Thank you, Sally. And everyone's like, oh, decentralized, decentralized. Oh, okay. But then when you get hacked, what happens? And people lose millions of dollars. So obviously that is not a good idea. Now let's move forward. Another thing is that it's trustless, right? Or um, I would say not completely trustless, but it, it allows for the ability for more transparency within systems. Like for instance, it can be used for voting. Um, right now I'm helping an organization that does participatory budgeting. It can help for that because money gets lost so easily within the budgets and we can actually see in real time who's money laundering, right? And how money's being moved around in our, in our public budgets. And then the last part is the data monetization for social impact because our data, like especially what happened with Facebook, our data is being sold all the time. What about if I put certain certain like functions on the blockchain, I can actually monetize on my data. So give me the money instead of these huge companies, okay? So um, how can blockchain help? Um, it, of course, accelerating social impact. I know that there's a refugee camp that's actually completely run on blockchain. It can help with identity management because there's something called identity genocide. It was coined by the United Nations. And when certain disasters happen, people lose everything, right? So how can I identify you? So they're using blockchain for that, using certain guardianship protocols. Um, also voting. 
we saw what just happened in this 2016 election and I'm knowing who we're dealing with, I'm 100% sure they're gonna try it again in 2020. So blockchain can be used for that. <clears throat> so what are some examples of the way blockchain is really being used to support social impact issues or you know, help with bettering our government and our society? Well, one, uh, the city of Berkeley, they are actually working on the blockchain initiative where they are taking bonds so I don't know if folks know this, but uh, your retirement funds, they're put into a system in California called CalPERS, and then they are put into something called that we call bonds, right? So those bonds are then like uh, traded on Wall Street and they are used to invest in certain activities that we may not agree with, like the Dakota Access Pipeline, Standing Rock, where they are trying to build a huge oil pipeline through sacred Native American land that ended up spilling and causing disaster, which they said it was gonna cause in the first place. So they're putting money into that. So Berkeley's like, instead of doing that, we're gonna take those bonds, put them on the blockchain, and allow the city of Berkeley to be able to, you know, buy and invest in those bonds to raise money for, um, for public infrastructure. So they're already doing it. And the first thing that they're doing is getting a fire truck. Next, they're going to move for a homeless shelter. So another thing that can it can be done, you know, cryptocurrency and blockchain can be used for is paying taxes. So Ohio, they are now allowing, you know, the uh, their taxes to be paid in um, Bitcoin. And something else that I did want to point you all to is a website called PositiveBlockchain.io, and it is a database of over six hundred blockchain for social impact projects. Okay. So, but there are some pitfalls, okay, because blockchain can be a double-edged sword, given the fact that it is an industry that is very much homogenous, and it is dominated by, the, you know, um, by people who come from a, a background of privilege, okay, and when Satoshi wrote that white paper, he, he basically was like, I want this to be used for financial revolution, so let's honor Satoshi, okay, and let's use this for what it was for. Thank you, Andrew, for all, for all your examples. Let me now. just finish here quickly. Yes, you want to make a comment. Like, all those are amazing, amazing examples. And, um, but I think that we're never going to get to the promises of what we can, blockchain can really deliver. We don't make the technology easy to use. And what's happening in many of the projects is that we really are taking away the word blockchain. And we're just seeing as a pure technology that's fueling all those great applications and projects. But we are very, very behind on getting there. For example, in Ohio, they have a huge problem for people to learn how to even buy Bitcoin and really pay. Mm -hmm. because I've been talking to them. So the thing is, we need to make blockchain easy in order to ensure that it's mainstream adoption. And any of those amazing projects and great ideas that are on the market can really exist and thrive. The number one thing that needs to happen is this infrastructure needs to be built. Because there are many core blockchains from the hyper largest of the world to the EOS of the world and the theorems of the world and the most famous one, Bitcoin, of course, and the different forks. But that, but all those are super complicated and they have a lot of issues. So there is, we need to really think about in terms of technology that there is a step before we get into the social impact into all the amazing promises that we need to build this infrastructure media layer. Like just imagine, I mean, I don't know, right now we receive emails from many different emails. I receive here from Yahoo, emails from Yahoo or Google or whatever. And we don't have to do anything. We don't even think because this interoperability is existing. So the only way that that's going to happen is that the more technology teams can create that that easy to use. And Sally, just so really quickly, I don't. Where where do you see where do you see uh, this in the next three to five years? So Betsy said we need to build the infrastructure. Daisy says we need to get the, you know, uh, take care of some of these pitfalls of the social injustice. Sally, where do you see blockchain going in the next three to five years? So I think we really need to improve the usability of blockchain. Like um, Beth uh, uh, mentioned before, this technology is amazing, but it's really only a handful of really technical people understand what it is. So for example, what we're doing at TEDx is that if you really open up our application, the front end application, you wouldn't know it's blockchain or not blockchain behind it. What you really need to show, what you really drive blockchain adoption is that you need to make people to use your product, which means this, in the, uh, this industry needs a lot of like, like general IT talents. For example, we need good UI person, we need good UX person, we need good 
people to really build an app that people like like normal average American can use it. Um, only if that. yeah, oh. only if only if um, um, people see the really real value about this app. Then you tell them, oh, it's actually blockchain behind it. Or oh, if without blockchain, you cannot use this as A, B, C, D, E uh, functions. That's where uh, the majority will really picks up the, the benefits of blockchain. Can I add something huh? to this? Because, hold on, oh, excuse of course. me. Um, so thank you, Betsy, for your statement. And thank you, Sala, for your statement. But I don't think that, you know, you were listening to what I had said in the beginning is in order for us to have that infrastructure, you need to get the buy-in from the public structure that has immediate access to the masses. So that's exactly the work that we've been doing. Like for instance, we actually just held um, a policy roundtable with the state, uh, California state treasurer, the chair for the, and um, all the economic development nonprofits across the state of California to actually talk about, okay, what blockchain technology is, how can it apply to our community and what can be done to actually make sure that we're building infrastructure for people to be able to get access in a more streamlined way. What tools can, are available? And we had people who are actually building out platforms um, to streamline access to blockchain and cryptocurrency actually presenting on some of the things that we have. So it's like, um, we're not putting the cart before the horse here. We understand that there are a, there is a lot of work that needs to be done in order for people to be able to utilize this technology. So I just wanted to make that clear because that's the reason why we're doing this in the first place. So how can female leaders manage the outcome of this? Because I'm hearing all of these great ideas, but let's say we're like, we're the leaders of the industry. How do you manage this? What do you um, mean, how do you manage this? Could you be more specific on your question, please? Um, yeah. So it sounds like Daisy, you're going through a, a government type of standpoint, but it's more, and you, and Sally and Betsy, you're in FinTech. So as leaders of those industries, how do you maneuver or manage the outcome? So, if, if that makes sense, like if, um, like how would we need to change our traditional mindsets? I'm trying to understand the question still, I'm sorry. Um, but let me just try to answer. Um, and and I, don't, I don't see myself, on well, what ICON is doing is not primarily in FinTech, it's across industries, it's truly technology. It's the um, technology fueled by blockchain. But the key word that you just used, how do we change our mindsets? I think that that's exactly what it is. It's a mindset shift and it's gonna only prove, and I'm gonna give an example. Um, it's gonna be only proven, in my opinion, when people can start using the tools easily. So Ever, Everpedia, which is created, um, is the wiki on blockchain. And Everpedia, mm -hmm. it means the encyclopedia, encyclopedia for everyone. And arguably is one of the, as of right now, one of the best funded projects and largest. And of course, because it comes with a lot of power, the founders of Wikipedia. So Everpedia has had a big problem. The pro big problem is that there's 40,000 unique users that come to the landing page, that were coming to the landing page almost every day, and they couldn't onboard them because it wasn't easy for the user, for the teacher, for the PhD doctor of, I don't know, of psychology to be able to create the wallets and understand how to use it. So what we did is we create, we have a specific product that enables Everpedia to be able to hide all the complexity of blockchain. So now they are onboarding all those different users. And because just that simplicity of make it simple to the end user, to the ordinary people on the street, that they can have the same experience of what they are accustomed today to just simply log in with a social, with just enter the page with a social, social login. That made a huge difference. And there are hundreds, and I will dare to say, now I haven't seen the data lately, but thousands, I will say it's almost thousand people now, that are writing and sharing information. And to me, that is a very use case scenario. We just need to enable people to start coming. And there are a lot of talks, talks all around the world. That every day there is a conference on blockchain. Every day there are conversations. There are telegram channels. There are institutions. Um, schools are incorporating, incorporating education of blockchain. Is the news is everywhere. We just need to be open to listen. And as I said, a few of us, when we started this conversation, and to question what we listen because not everything is true. Um, so. I think that is just, we need to keep pushing forward. I, I, don't know, I don't know if I answered your question, but I think really the key 
to work here is changing our mindset by keep pushing forward and being open to a new learning experience. So if, one, if someone wanted to get involved, what, how would they want to, or if they wanted to help, how would you suggest they go about doing that? Sally? Mm, can you be, sorry, be more specific? Like what do they want to help in, in terms of? So uh, if, if someone wanted to work with you, let's say on financial inclusion on the blockchain, how would they go about doing that? Or like, what would you suggest that they, they do? I think there are probably two aspects of it. Uh, the first aspect is you need uh, a community that uh, can truly understand blockchain, which means we probably need a lot of people like educate the cloud of what is the benefit of blockchain. But most importantly, uh, we need a lot of great product people to really build, let's say, a Google map of blockchain, you know? So at the end of the day, it's really about the product usability and the product adoption to really showcase uh, uh, to people like, oh, this is a great technology, this is a great product. Um, it's exactly like what Steve Jobs did for iPhone. He made sure that even grandma can know how to use iPhone without a, like this thick of a, you know, menu. So this is also what we need to do in a lot of this um, blockchain initiatives. You, we need to make sure our product is easy enough to use and you need to make sure um, the performance, all the infrastructure is, is re ready for commercial launch. Mm -hmm. Daisy, how do you stay true to your core values? Daisy. Uh, I think honestly, yes ma'am. Can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you and you are so, uh -oh. like, you really are very passionate. Can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? I can. Okay, awesome. Um, well, I think the one thing about like, what can people do to get involved in blockchain is just understand that uh, blockchain is going to really touch almost every industry. So whatever industry that they're in, they can utilize their skills Two, um, I think just recognizing this is just, this is the beginning of the industry, right? So if you really are talking about you want to be in this for the long haul, just get ready. Okay continue to do, you know, your education, like Bitsabi said, there's always some type of conference or workshop or something. Um, let's just keep going to educate yourself. And the way that I stay close to my values is I, I, like you said, I'm a very passionate person. Some people misconstrue that for whatever they misconstrue it as, but I just really think that this technology has some potential if we can work out, you know, the, the kinks and um, some of the downsides of it to, you know, really support, um, communities that are really like suffering and are, and are at a disadvantage. So that's how I stay close to my values. And I always continue to educate myself properly on what are the real issues in society? What, how can I be a support? Because I think folks, you know, I know that I was born to, to build something. I knew that I was born to help some folks. I, Cause that's all that I've been doing for the past like 10 years. So that's how I stay close to my values. And realizing that, yeah, money is cute and, you know, sitting on these different panels and going to these conferences, that's cute. But at the end of the day, that there, there's real stuff happening in our world. So we all have a duty to, you know, support one another and support those who are less advantaged. And Betsby, how do you stay true to your core values? That's an excellent question. So um, I always have to remind myself why we st I started ICON. And the reason that we started ICON is because we truly wanted to make sure that technology can survive. And you know, and this, and this, and the reason that I feel it's a really question is because I love social impact and I agree with everything, with everything that Daisy said. And sometimes I feel like, wow, I wanna be building a very powerful microfinance platform or whatever. But I truly believe that what um, Sally said, we need to have a very easy UI. UX. We need to really build that infrastructure technology. And every day I question myself, is that really what I want? And yes, that is how I maintain myself true to my values. At the end of the day, I always review what I did and ask, is this helping blockchain to become easier and easier for my mom, for my brothers? I'm from Mexico, my family's in Mexico, and they're not that technical. But it's always kind of my, they are my balance, they keep me balanced. Is this really the technology that they will eventually use? The people around me that are not technical, can they use it? 
So that's how I maintain true to my values. That's fantastic. I, um, I think Anisha may have some questions from of some of the viewers. So I, I know we need some final notes here, but Anisha, do you have some questions for them? Uh, hi. Um, <laughs> thank you for a very great and, uh, you know, enriching discussion. Um, uh, I, I myself learned a lot from all of you discussing so passionately about, about blockchain and, uh, uh, the viewers, uh, if you have any question, you should uh, type in to the to the panelists. And I think uh, a lot of them are asking, and uh, Daisy and Betsabi have been answering them. Okay, okay perfect. But uh, uh, if you have any other questions, you can please feel free to type in. And I think we can give them a minute or two to type in. And <laughs> does anybody have any lasting yeah. thoughts? Like Sally, do you have any any? Anything you want to end on while we're waiting for some questions? Um, so I think I saw one of the questions about what is the acceptance or expectation for blockchain in B2B versus B2C. So I will put this way. So B2C, I would say it's easier for B2C projects to get someone to try it out because for end users, probably just download the app or like log into this platform to try it out. But for B2B, the expectation is that for you to get a business to really try out your product, you probably would expect a longer adoption time. Uh, it, is, it, it will be the same as a non-blockchain-based application because uh, there are a lot of like uh, review and discussion and decision time inside of organization. But end of the day, you need to think uh, the decision makers are still humans. So what are their objectives? And is your product easy to understand without like a huge like piece of code to tell them, oh, this is blockchain, this is great. So at the end of the day, still, uh, regardless B2P or B2C, the expectation is you have to make your product uh, easy enough to uh, be understand and be used, basically. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Betsy, um, I, I saw you answering some questions, but are there any highlights there? Mm, I, there are two things that I would like just to share. One is that I, there is a lot of institutions that start doing proof of concepts to learn more about blockchain. And I think that the more institutions, entrepreneurs, startups start testing the technology, eventually we will get that to the mainstream adoption with the new, exactly. new infrastructure. Um, the other thing that I want to share, and I just learned that yesterday, I met with one of my girlfriends who, uh, girlfriends who is a, you know, was a general counsel at Ripple, and she shared with me her experience of being a Ripple and learning blockchain. And one of the things she says is that blockchain is like a Rubik cube, that you are trying to put it together and you see a side and you get excited because it looks perfect. But when you turn to the other side, it's not even close <laughs> to it. And that's exactly what I feel that is blockchain. <laughs> perfect analogy it's truly this Rubik's cube that you think you are just getting to understand it and keep changing the game so one of the things that i want to encourage everyone that is learning about, about blockchain and want to get involved to never give up and don't get frustrated so much to learn exactly. it will yeah. be a lot of that that's great advice <laughs> and uh daisy you got any uh, thoughts on the questions that we had or some final thoughts um I as blockchain. Okay, people are asking live questions. Oh wow, a handful of large entities. Hmm. I think we have a good seven or eight minutes left. So okay. So I. Well, Let I think me. That we uh, all covered it. Uh, so, sorry, Daisy, to interrupt you, but uh, I would like to. Uh, are you answering the question by Mike? Or oh, I was gonna. Do, I was gonna go into that afterwards. Okay, but so, I think just the last thing that I say. I see. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Because uh, people okay. won't be able to read through, so we'll have to repeat the questions. So that's why I wanted to like give you a heads up. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna let you do that. Sure. Um, sure. I, I I feel I'm honored to be you know on this webinar with women who are doing really good work in this space. I me personally, I just feel like being a woman is not enough to be on blockchain. Um, you also have to have that really innovative and revolutionary mind state because we're talking about this is the future of money, right? This is the future of industry. So we gotta come with new ideas. And also, um, you know, talking to our folks who work in those traditional finance industries and in the banking sectors and, you know, just continuing to raise awareness about blockchain, even if they look at you like, okay, well, you must be a scam artist because I heard about that scam Bitcoin. Blockchain is beyond that. 
it's more, way more <laughs> than that, you know? So we have to just continue to educate people. Just keep educating people. Fantastic. Yeah. Was there a question, Anisha, for the panelist? Yeah, there's a question from Michael. He's asking that uh, as blockchain matures and scales, do you see a risk of it being monopolized by a handful of large entities and agencies? Much like the internet itself is dominated by a small group of mega corporations, social networks and service and infrastructure providers. That's an excellent question. Uh, let's see, Daisy, do you have an answer for that? I mean, yeah, of course, as they monopolize <laughs> as that's only, it's only common knowledge that this is where they're gonna go next. And I know that right now, actually, um, the major banks are actually collaborating on creating a, a collective blockchain platform. And they're talking about that it's gonna be able to predict people's like credit scores, spending habits. I think that that's such a terrible idea. And I really, and I feel like the folks who ran really bad ICOs and were really scammy in the space, they put us in the spotlight of these different corporations in a way that, what, just in a way that is not gonna be beneficial for the rest of you know society because they of course are going to use this technology to for the purposes that they've always used technology for, which is to subjugate and control and et cetera. Sally, what do you think about that? Because you are in the fintech. Yeah, so um, my take is that the industry is too new and too early to really predict what's going to happen in, let's say, five, 10 years. And will there be a monopoly in this market? Maybe. Maybe there's a one uh, or like less than five fundamental chain which will really lead the industry eventually. But the difference between blockchain versus the traditional uh, centralized business is that blockchain regardless is building under, uh, on a either semi-decentralized, uh, like EOS, like they don't have as much nodes as Ethereum, but they're still like decentralized or like a truly decentralized blockchain such as Ethereum. So even though let's say Ethereum is gonna still dominate the blockchain, uh, community for the next five years, but that's okay because the power is not controlled by one person in that network. It's controlled by uh, a pool of people. Yes, you will see someone who has more money can purchase more computing power to execute certain transactions, but still compared to a centralized business, it's still much more, I would say, diverse in that aspect. All right, that's me. Any thoughts on that? Um, I, I agree with Sally. I think that the industry is too early to really predict. I think that perhaps the answer is yes, there is some risk, let's say 50-50 at this point. And I think that it will be perhaps a few blockchains, the big players with multiple ledgers infrastructure, and there will be some blockchains for a specific industry, some blockchains for a specific geography. Um, but it's early to tell. And yes, perhaps there is a risk still. We are trying to mitigate the risk, but until we have more clarity, and I would say we're gonna have more clarity in the next six, six months to a year, once we go over this crypto winter and we start seeing the true projects that survive, because right now, I don't know if many of you have heard funding has been very tough for many projects. To get funding has been very tough for many projects. And this is truly cleaning a lot of projects and is bringing yeah. out the projects that are impacting massively and will I help the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. I think this market is actually a good thing in the long run for this industry because only good projects and cost conscious projects can survive this winter, let's call it this way. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, you know, some other projects probably raise a lot of money when there's an ICO hype, but they also spend a lot of money without thinking about it or without really thought, think through, can this be sustainable? So I think it's a good thing that we're in a winter right now. So a lot of projects is slowing, slowing down, raising the money and spend more time to polish the product. So I think in the long run, it's a good thing. And you, sh you always see like great company actually survived through Absolutely. winter. Absolutely. Once you are over the irrational exuberance, the, the good projects will remain. And this is what we're going to, I think, and I talk to many people um, constantly asking, um, and I think that it's going to be in the next six months to 12 months when we're going to see who are those that are going to be leading and surviving. I mean, you, many people just 
I don't know who has read the news about consensus, but Jolo being one of the uh, founders of Ethereum, that build this massive empire and need to let go of more than half, more than 50% of the people that they get hired even six months ago, two weeks ago. So it's, um, it's doing a lot of good cleanup um, and still to be seen. Fantastic. Anisha, since it's at six o'clock, I'm going to, I just want to tell you guys, thank you so much for letting me be involved with this. Thank you for being a panelist. I'm going to hand this back over to Anisha and uh, I, I'm honored to be a part of this. Thank you. Anisha, how can we, what do we do? Everyone. Thank you, everyone. I, I think we can go five minutes above because I have a question running in my head. Um, so uh, like, um, so from what I understand that uh, you need to be in industry for some decent amount of time to step into blockchain. Is, is it true? Because like as a fresher, if you just have poor knowledge of any other, any field, like Daisy was mentioning that you, you, you can have like any kind of skill that you build in college or anything, but uh, you, you need to know how the industry is working to be able to uh, apply blockchain. And for that, you need to be in the, in the industry for a specific number of uh, time, or you need to be experienced in that. So as a founder, you can't go in the blockchain industry. Is it right to say that? Mm. So, let me, can I jump in quickly? I, I don't know. I don't think that that's, that's uh, sorry if, if that's what we, we convey. But no, I think that any, anyone can jump in into it. Like I have hired um, UX people with little experience or a lot of experience. Um, but they're just really good at what they do. And it's not the experience, it's how amazing they are at the work that they deliver and their commitment to working any hour that's necessary any day. And I have hired also developers, uh, um, office managers, operations people. But one of the things that I always look into someone is this ability to learn. Because I feel that I can work better with someone that is humble and is still able to learn and that um, has a strong passion for the technology itself and that I'm not gonna have to hang hold them every single step along the way. And I don't, I don't see how many years I'm in the industry, I just see what are they actually bringing and how they are integrated into the team. I guess a lot of the cultural aspects are very important for the blockchain community and the blockchain companies. I mean, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. I, and I just want to throw this out here. I am an event planner by trade, but I just really loved the women in blockchain that I met. They were, honestly, Daisy was one of the first piece, people that I met. And it's just amazing what um, they're trying to do with, uh, you know, by creating good. So I, I, I don't think so either. I think anybody can jump into the blockchain community and everyone is welcoming. Mm -hmm. But uh, Sally, Daisy, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I, I completely was, agree with you guys. Um, it's all about, are you a problem solver? Uh, are you, can you learn as you go? Because we're in this new industry. Actually, a lot of times, if you want me to write a job description of a position that I'm hiring, I don't have that job, job description. You don't know what's ahead of you. This is what a new industry would look like. Um, it, it's essentially like the early days of Google. No one has ever run a search engine whose revenue is from an ad. So how can you hire any ad experts who has done that thing before? Because a lot of things we're doing right now has never been done before. So it's not easy to hire people by their uh, experience because there's no such experience. So it's all about the personality. Do you have the work ethic? Do you have the commitment? Do you have the belief in what you're doing? And are you a fast learner? Can you work with the team? Can the team trust on you? So that's what's really important in joining a new industry like blockchain. Trust, that's a great word. Daisy, what do you think? I agree with everything that Sally has said and other folks. Um, and just to reiterate what I said earlier, because blockchain is gonna touch every industry, um, they need all kinds of skills. They need people who are lawyers. They need people who are, um, you know, uh, good with intellectual property. They need people who have been finance and education and because blockchain can be applied to almost um, any ecosystem. So that's what I have to say about that. Don't be afraid to get in, but just make sure that you are ready to keep educating yourself and that you're ready to, you know, stay in this for the long haul because they need people who are going to be dedicated and sustainable. 
Thank you, everyone. This is a Thank very you. positive response. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you Thank you, everyone, for uh, for your time today, and uh, uh, really got to learn. And I'm I'm sure uh, a lot of our viewers are going to get back to you, and your your inboxes are going to be flooded. So you may might want to drop your uh, like uh, a contact information or anything uh, on the on the chat so that uh, anyone who wants to connect to you can uh, contact you. Um, thank you to all the viewers uh, who joined us this uh, evening, morning, all zones. And uh, we hope to uh, see you in blockchain conferences around. And uh, also on, uh, on every Saturday sessions that we have, uh, please, please feel free to join in and learn something new every Saturday. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 B